Hello, everyone, and welcome to week three, lecture three of Introduction to Tourism and Hospitality Management. I want to um, go ahead and get started as we have a lot to talk about, but certainly welcome and thank you all for joining. This week, we're going to be talking, um, there is only one lesson in the text, but there are two articles that I will ask you to be uh, sure to have read. So the one article, the one uh, lesson is lesson number three, which is trends uh, in the uh, uh, textbook, in Harbor Schwanner textbook, and then the two New York Times articles. Hello, everyone, and welcome to week three. Um, so I do also want to uh, mention that we are having, as you should be aware, uh, the short paper assignment this week, and that is a team paper. So I'm going to talk about that a little bit more in the next slide. Um, but please remember that you will be paired up, or or there will perhaps be three of you, um, and you will need to submit your paper um, and provide feedback to your fellow uh, uh, students. And then, of course, we'll finish with the lecture on trends. So the short paper that you're going to be writing is um, focused on the reading materials. So you can select a topic from either of the articles or from the text or from this lecture. But you're required to write a short paper on that text. Uh, uh, I'm sorry, on that topic. And that is, uh, it's important for you to make sure that it's substanti substantial. Uh, it's 500 or so words. I really want to make sure that you cover the topic. Um, you shouldn't have to do any additional research beyond the m material that you're able to get from the text and or the lecture and or the articles. Um, but again, make sure that it's a substantial overview of the topic that you're covering. And then as you can see here on the slide, uh, the first thing that you need to do is upload your draft of your paper by Thursday. The sooner the better, but the last date you can submit it or the, uh, the due date is uh, Thursday. Um, because we need you to be able to have your fellow students have the opportunity to review it, and then by the end of day on Friday to provide their feedback. So there's a short turnaround time. So the ask would be, I'm going to send out an email to all of you. You'll be able to see who you're paired up with. If it makes sense for you to reach out to them to coordinate timing of, of your assignments, if you need to ask them to provide you feedback sooner rather than Friday, all of those things, please do so. Um, you'll have their names. You can reach out to them. My point here is uh, it's important that you have the opportunity to provide good feedback to your fellow associate, uh, fellow students uh, to be able to review their papers and give them the feedback that they need to have. So it could be minor things such as spelling or gra grammatical uh, corrections, but it could be and it should also include more substantive discussion around the topic, and perhaps you could suggest other examples that they may give, et cetera. Uh, so, um, and then once you've gotten the feedback from your fellow students by Friday afternoon or Friday evening, uh, and then Saturday and Sunday, you need to finalize your documents and then upload it into the second section here, which is the short paper assignment. Um, and so that number two arrow is where you would submit your final paper. So please reach out to me if you have any questions on this. It's um, really important that you have the opportunity to read your fellow students' work, to think about it, and to help them to uh, improve their work. I'd also ask, and I would, uh, an unwritten expectation is that you take an opportunity to read everyone's papers. It wouldn't take too long to read everyone's papers. You certainly don't have to provide feedback, but that's why I did it in the forum environment so that you have a chance to see what the other students are thinking about. So now we're going to move into trends. Uh, the trends in the hospitality industry are really something that I will, uh, just as a programming note here, I will say, or not programming note, but editorial note, I will say in the last uh, five years, trends in the hospitality, in the restaurant, as well as in the lodging, uh, food and restaurant industries has exploded in terms of the number of different trends. There's always been trends, of course, 
Um, but with the addition of the disruptive technologies and innovations and, and disruptive or innovative uh, business models that have come out in the last five years, the trends in the industry have really changed a lot and have really, uh, it becomes a daily, um, a daily uh, update in terms of what we're doing in terms of these trends and where they're going and which direction they're taking. So it's really an exciting time to be in the industry. So our objectives from the text are to understand the power and influence that social media is having on all aspects of the hospitality industry and where technology is headed. And so technology, um, in my previous position, I did a lot of technology work and was uh, very fortunate to have been able to participate in a lot of projects with Starwood Hotels to, uh, to, to drive technology and to, to really be on the leading edge of that technology. So I'm going to share some, some things there. Um, but technology is... Uh, you know, certainly impacting restaurants and food service. Um, and the social media is a huge part of the business model now. And we talked about it somewhat last week, uh, and we're going to continue to talk about it through this course because social media has changed a lot of the, the landscape. We're also going to grasp the reality of what consumers are wanting and what they are responding to as their desire to support green operators. There are a lot of green... Um, initiatives in place in different industries. Uh, the hospitality business is no different. Uh, and there are some actually, I would have to say that the, the hospitality industry um, has been a lead leader in this uh, area somewhat. And uh, we'll talk about that in a few minutes. We're also going to just talk about in general trends within the food industry um, and trends within the lodging industry. Now, I do want to say um, that there is uh, important information, like I said, in those New York Times articles. So I would ask you to make sure that you read those and consider using those in your uh, this week's assignment. So we're going to dive right in. The social and review sites have just exploded. Uh, every day there's a new one that comes out, and it's um, it's evident that no one these days, or very few people these days, uh, go anywhere, whether it's to go on vacation or to go out to dinner, um, without looking at what other people are saying on the website, on um, uh, websites or on the internet, right? And so TripAdvisor, Yelp, Urban Spoon, Hotels.com um, are information gathering sources for us, for travelers, and review sites are a huge part of that, of course. Um, you know, one or two uh, bad comments, bad reviews on a, a restaurant's uh, Urban Spoon or Yelp, I should say, or TripAdvisor can really damage their reputation and uh, impact their business, of course, if it's severe enough. Um, the same with, to some extent, with the positive reviews. Positive reviews uh, certainly help to drive business. There's been, there have been studies that have shown that um, the uh, the ranking in TripAdvisor, as an example for the hotel business, correlates directly with the ability to charge higher rates, uh, which you could imagine if you have a higher rated um, TripAdvisor uh, score, you would be able to drive more business. Now, there has been in the news in the last five years, but uh, not as much recently as there was three or four years ago, a lot of uh, hotels and restaurants that had, not a lot, but but some hotels and restaurants that had um, participated in uh, some bogus reviews. And, and TripAdvisor and other review sites have really focused on cracking down on that so that owners and operators are not either posting positive reviews for their own ho uh, hotel or restaurant, but also similarly not posting negative reviews for their competition. And uh, TripAdvisor certainly takes that into consideration and it takes that very seriously. Um, they do monitor that, but it's difficult because for you to go on to TripAdvisor uh, and post a review, you're not required at any point in that process to prove that you actually ate in that restaurant or stayed in that hotel. Um, and so that becomes problematic. Crowdsourcing. Um, 
there are many apps and many websites that allow uh, or encourage Facebook is one where a guest, uh, a guest, uh, someone will say, I will say to my friends on Facebook, hey, I'm going to be in Seattle on, on Wednesday night uh, celebrating, wanted to find out what's the best restaurant. And uh, I will get you know, dozens of suggestions from friends. Um, those type of crowdsourcing opportunities are another uh, opportunity. And, the, and there are specific sites that, that focus just on that. So crowdsourcing for suggestions. And then online booking, um, that it is clear that we as a, as a, um, that our entire court culture is moving towards doing more and more online and online bookings is really the way that, uh, that most of the businesses are getting their, um, getting their leads at this point. And, and so, Websites, all businesses have websites that allow for some type of web bookings. Um, an interesting comment here, one that's not listed on the slide, but it, it speaks to where I started when I first turned to this slide. It's been shown that 80% of travelers do research on the review sites and social media before they buy, before they make a reservation, 80% are um, going out and um, doing this type of research. The other thing to note is because of the, the explosion in the number of review sites, there are additional sites that have been developed in the last several years to help operators to aggregate all of those reviews. And so Review Analyst is one that my company uses and I know other companies use Review Analyst as well. And what that does is that brings all of those different reviews together on one page and it creates a dashboard so that the operator can see um, without having to go on to TripAdvisor and, and Yelp and all of the various sites individually, it, they can see it in one location. So I wanted to share this next, um, this next interesting company or business model here it is called Hotelied. Hotelied is a um, recently launched app that, that really tailors hotel recommendations based on your social media profile. So what this does, Hotelied looks at what you have liked on your social media sites, who you follow, what your friends like, and who your friends follow. And then based on that, it makes a recommendation as to where you should stay. This is not a very... Um, popular yet website. I just wanted to show this to give an example of what's going on in the industry with regards to uh, trends in social media. It's really branching out. No longer is it just enough to have a uh, to have a um, presence on social media sites, but now actually to give you suggestions based off of your presence. So then we're going to look at um, the next area, which is so moving away from social media, green initiatives and in travel. And this is, as I said at the beginning, uh, a big part of hotel and restaurant operations. And so there are some things that hotels and businesses have uh, put in place operationally, as well as having um, been involved in this myself. I know it is uh, a frequent and constant discussion for capital expenditure discussions and projects spent on um, how we can become more green. Every company that I'm aware of anyways has some type of goal to improve their, uh, to, to lessen their carbon footprint, to improve their, their overall green initiatives by X percentage and Sometimes these uh, require huge operational changes and capital change, uh, capital expenditures. So recycling and composting. Um, there's a huge push, of course, to recycle and to compost in the city of Seattle, um, but it goes beyond that. There are, in my own hotel, we spend a, a significant amount of time educating our associates. So we're not just recycling um, trash that comes out of guest rooms and, and composting 
food items that come out of the restaurant, but we're also doing it in our own areas. And so as an example, in our employee cafeteria, we have all of the recycling and composting and trash uh, bins with pictures of each item. And, and we've spent a significant amount of time with all of the various languages spoken in our hotel. Um, it's not just as easy as posting a a sign that says what goes in what. We have pictures, visuals, and we do a lot of training. And those extend throughout the entire hotel. We also have what's called aqua recycle. And this is something that many large-scale operations have. Our hotel, a 1,236-room hotel, 1236 hotel um, we have a gigantic laundry operation. Uh, the tunnel washer is what it's called, is as long as uh, my entire house it literally would go from my front porch to my back porch. And um, it's not quite as wide, but, but it's this gigantic piece of equipment that the laundry is put in one end uh, and the, the dirty laundry and out the back end comes the, the clean laundry and, and then it's taken to the, to the dryers. But in that process, a significant amount of water is used, as you can imagine. So about four years ago, we spent a significant amount of capital monies on a aqua recycle system. And what that does is it takes the water that is used in the, in the rinse cycles and it reuses that water. It, it filters and reuses the water as, uh, as much as is possible in order to reduce the number of, or the gallons of water used. Uh, most hotels have some type of low flow shower heads, low flow, um, toilets and this is something that if you can imagine when a when you have a thousand rooms or more that you have to replace all of the shower heads it's a significant expense but in the long run the return on the investment pays for itself of course because of the lowered water bills over time energy efficient lighting um, is both a a must-have and an issue um a lot of guests and associates as well do not like the the different lighting, um, uh, the different types of light that the low uh, that the uh, lower in energy or high high efficiency lighting has. Um, we have sensors. I'll give an example of another thing that we do. We have sensors in our lights in the guest bathroom, and so if you don't move while you're in the bathroom, or if you turn the light on and walk into the bed area of the guest room, eventually that light will go off. And that has actually become a dissatisfier because a lot of guests turn on that bathroom light as a night light, um, which isn't very efficient, but we've had to uh, reanalyze our uh, plans as to whether or not we're going to keep those sensors in the in the bathroom um, because of the fact that many times guests will have turned on the light, they'll get into bed, they'll wake up in the middle of the night and it will have turned off and they will be unhappy with that. So again, it's just another operational um, consideration in the green initiatives in travel. Now, green teams are uh, important, and green teams in our hotel is uh, basically a group of associates. There are a few managers, but we have mostly gone with an associate-driven team um, who get together, and we review and talk about what we could be doing differently or what we could be doing better to be greener. And so as an example, our last meeting, which was about two weeks ago, um, we met and we went out to the loading dock and we looked at where all of our composting uh, bins are taken is into the large compost dumpster and we looked at the recycling uh, dumpster and the trash dumpster and we talked about the processes of ensuring that we didn't have the wrong items going into the wrong bins and um, you know because if you do as an example if you do have a compost bin and somebody throws trash in there, you can have that entire bin um, basically become trash because you can't use it for composting if there's uh, anything in there other than the compost. So we spend a lot of time talking about how to improve those processes. We look at, uh, you know, we do audits. The, the green team walks into a meeting, uh, I'm sorry, a, a department 
area as as an example we walked into the housekeeping department and we reviewed their recycling efforts within their department and we looked at what training materials they had in place and we came up with some suggestions for things that they may want to do differently so green teams are a, are a associate driven activity that really helps to keep green initiatives alive in hotels and restaurants too restaurants as well the last thing here is green meetings reports um, and um, there is a the meeting planners and event planners uh, more and more are requiring that hotels and, and meeting venues and restaurants provide them with proof of their green initiatives um, many times site inspections so big groups that plan events four or five years uh, in the future will come to the hotel as an example and the first thing they'll want to see or among other things they'll want to see is what green initiatives we have in place what are we doing to take care of the environment as part of their own stewardship efforts they are requiring that their providers uh, maintain green programs as well. And so we have meet green meetings reports, which basically um, allows a meeting planner after the close of their event, we can actually show them how much energy we saved through the um, use of the high efficiency um, lighting and water that we have in the meeting space. We don't put bottled water on the tables anymore in plastic bottles. We put uh, water that we have filtered ourselves and bottled ourselves and reused the bottles and all of those efforts, everything that we do from the kitchen um, composting to the low flow shower heads is included in these green meeting reports, which allows our meeting planners to report back to their um, teams as to uh, what efforts are being done at the hotel level to, to support their uh, stewardship efforts. And then if you go on to almost any hotel, cruise line, or airline website, and you do enough searching, you'll find their green program. Um, and so this brings up one last topic to, to mention. And there is what we would consider, or what is, has been called greenwashing. And that is some uh, companies, and I can't even, I couldn't even come up with an example of it, but it's out there. Um, it's probably not the big companies. It's probably the smaller operations that don't have all of the layers of, of uh, checks and balances in place. Um, but they're greenwashing. And what that means is they're saying that they're green, but in all truth, they're really not. They're, they're just doing it for, um, for their marketing purposes. So they're not genuine in their green efforts. And that's something that is in the news as well and, and you need to be aware of. So I wanted to give an example of uh, what our hotel has done. And um, one of the things that I can say very proudly is that the, the Sheraton Seattle has been involved in green initiatives for many, many, many years. And um, one of the things that happened early on was there was a, a program that was put into place um, and I can't say for certain whether or not the Sheraton Seattle Hotel was the first to do it, but it was an early adopter if it wasn't the first, which was a card that was put on the bed that said, if you'd like us to reuse your towels or not to change your sheets, please uh, please put this card on the, the bed, right? And so what that did was, or it would say, uh, if you want to reuse your towels, please rehang them on the hook. Um, basically, up until that point, there were every day when a room attendant went into a guest room, they stripped all of the bed linen, sheets, pillow covers, uh, blankets, everything, and all of the towels from the room and sent them down to the laundry to be washed and then replaced them all with clean, fresh linens. Now, if you do this at home, um, I would be very surprised. Uh, most of us go four or five days maybe, sometimes more, but most often less, um, before we throw a towel that we're using in the bath, as an example, into the laundry bin. And so it just made sense for hotels to do the same thing. And in doing that, it obviously saved thousands and thousands of gallons of water and 
electricity and natural gas and everything else. And so taking it a step further, in 2007, 2008, um, I was fortunate enough to be involved with a project team that came from a uh, Weston in Hawaii, uh, actually on Maui, that had started um, this thing that went by different names at the time. We just knew it as, um, it, it is now known as Make a Green Choice. But what this has evolved into and what we did at, at our hotel, at the Sheraton Seattle Hotel, was we worked with coming up with different options for our guests to decline for housekeeping even to come into their room in return for um, some type of credit. And so when we started this, we did different, uh, different amounts. Um, we took a, we said, you know, if you can turn down housekeeping and help us to, to save the environment, and that was without any pay. We also did a $5 coupon and we did a $10 coupon. Another hotel that we partnered with um, took a different approach and said, okay, if you turn down housekeeping, we at the hotel will donate $5 to a charity. And so we tried these different, um, these different plans and these different offerings to find out which one our guests uh, enjoyed or utilized the most. And it was the $5 coupon that made the most sense. And so right now, um, if a guest who's staying with us for more than two days turns down housekeeping service, we will give them a $5 per, um, voucher to use in the restaurant, um, or we'll give them 500 Starwood Preferred Guest Points. And the this, as you can imagine, is uh, something that a lot of guests participate in. A lot of guests would rather get this $5 food and beverage voucher or the 500 points, especially if their company is paying for their stay anyways. Um, and what it does for the hotels is it, it saves tremendously in the amount of water, chemicals, natural gas that's used to heat the, the laundry um, equipment, and, uh, to, to, to power the laundry equipment, I should say, and then chemicals. And so as you can see on this slide, one night stay can save for each guest room that participates 37 gallons of water. Um, and so this is just an amazing um, program that has had a lot of a lot of uh, other companies doing the same thing. There are a lot of hotels that have a very similar program in place. If you stay at a Marriott, which I did recently, you'll find that they have a very similar program. It's not called Make a Green Choice, of course, but they have a very similar program. So now talking about trends in the food industry, there's one um, thing that is very popular these days, and that is sustainable sourcing. Uh, there is a website, which you can see the, the icon here, called Green Chef's Blue Ocean. And this is a, a, a truly a comprehensive and interactive online course that allows chefs to go through a sustainable seafood training program. And it, it is free. It uh, it's allows the chefs to better understand um, how to source their food and what to look for in uh, procurement. So... All of these things uh, speak to the fact that sustainable sourcing, providing um, food to, our, to your guests in a sustainable manner. So it's not buying uh, citrus fruits that have to be shipped from uh, halfway around the world. It's buying from a local farmer. It's um, preserving the, the farming community in your own environment and sustaining uh, sustainable sourcing also, of course, is, um, you know, looking at what seafood is on your menu. And swordfish, as an example, about eight years ago, um, was a popular menu item. And because of the depletion of the swordfish uh, in the oceans, uh, they, the chefs realized, or the general public realized, that if we continued on that track, we wouldn't have, uh, we would, we would drive them to extinction. So the, the menu items nowadays more and more, especially when you're looking at seafood, um, are from more and more from sustainable sources.
Another giant trend in both the food industry, but also the lodging industry is technology and the ability to, as I mentioned before, to have guests go online and make their reservations, but also the technology in the dining room. So there are um, the point of sale systems, the POS, point of sale POS systems, which the wait staff uses to enter in the, the item that you've ordered. So, uh, you know, the wait staff comes to your table and you order the, the salmon, they will put that into the POS. Um, and where the technology has changed in the last five years is now there are handheld POS systems. So they come to your table, they enter it there through Wi-Fi. It is transmitted to the kitchen. The, the ability to uh, do menu reporting analysis, um, to be able to, to look at what items are selling, to look at what uh, integrating not only the, the menu price of that item into this POS system, but also the food cost. So you can see where you're making your most money and where you're leaving the most on the table, if you will. Um, and so technology has really allowed restaurants, even the smaller restaurants, to take a big data approach to their business, um, which a few years ago was impossible. Another big trend is nutrition. Um, uh, we've all, in general, become more conscious of nutrition and the need to cut out trans fats and to cut out cholesterol or cut down on cholesterol, uh, fatty foods, um, you know, the, the non-GMO, um, genetic, genetically modified uh, food items, the drive towards more organic items. And then another thing that is um, in the news a lot, and uh, it continues to become more and more prevalent, is the need to be aware of allergies. I can't say, and no one can say for certain, what is driving the increased number of, or the apparent increase in the number of allergies um, that are out there in the public. There's different theories around that, and I'm not going to explore those in this lecture. But the, the fact is that more and more of the general population is allergic to different items. And so gluten um, is a huge one. Um, and nut-free uh, or nut allergies, uh, the, these various allergies that are requiring our food industry providers to really focus on ensuring that they have maintained processes to eliminate cross-contamination because, um, as an example, if you go to a uh, Thai restaurant and they are making curry in the wok and you have a nut allergy, if you ask for a nut-free um, dish to be prepared, they need to wipe down the wok. They need to make sure that they are not reusing that same wok because some people that um, they're allergy to nuts would be such that just that contact with the food in the cooking process would be enough to, uh, to cause them a reaction. And so, again, this is a huge trend uh, that continues to develop. Financial, the financial trend in the food industry, um, we're at the epicenter in Seattle and in the Pacific Northwest. We already have uh, one of the highest minimum wage laws. Um, but with regards to the recent uh, movement towards a $15 an hour wage, um, this is requiring hotel and restaurant operators to really consider how they uh, operate and, and what their cost breakdown is going to be. Um, there are obviously a lot of opinions on both sides of this, and I'm not going to, to go one side or the other on this debate, but I am going to say that it does require an operator to fully understand what this impact is going to have on them. If they're going to suddenly offer $15 an hour, does that mean that they have to spend less on marketing? Does it mean that they take less profits, that they pay less profits to their owners? What does it mean to their business? Um, also, the uh, break laws. Um, so there are very strict laws, and this depends on where you live. So in 
California as an example, there are much more strict uh, break laws than in some other parts of the country, but Washington's has a pretty strict law as well, um, that after a set number of hours of work that you have to give your associates time to take a break and then a lunch break after um, another period of hours has passed by. And I'm, I know the Washington state one, but in general, it varies so much that I'm not going to get into specifics here. Just to know that you need to, as an operator, understand what the trends are in those break laws um, in your municipality so that you make sure that you're not in violation of them. Another trend that we're seeing more and more is the non-traditional operations. And this is the food trucks. This is pop-up restaurants. Uh, there's some great articles, and I, I uh, didn't assign the reading, but there's some, um, some chefs that are out there that are taking this concept of a pop-up restaurant. And so they may find an abandoned bank building, as an example. And they would take it over for a couple of days and would turn it into a restaurant and would serve food from that location um, and then take all of their equipment and leave. And so that's a pop-up restaurant, which is a, a new trend in a non-traditional way. Food trucks. Um, food trucks is big business in some cities. Uh, Portland has long been known for a food truck uh, culture. Um, Seattle has some, to some extent, other cities San Francisco and many on the West Coast. New York has always had the food carts, um, not so much the food trucks, but the food carts on the corners. Um, these things continue to evolve to the point where now restaurants and hotels actually have their own food trucks. So there is a, um, as an example, uh, some hotels actually have a food truck that they send out to the, the neighboring community. Uh, and it is a an opportunity for them to market, but it also uh, enables them to explore some non-traditional operations. So now, trends in lodging. Um, this is something that uh, we you will hear about as you work in the lodging industry, if you work in the lodging industry, which is added fees. Um, there are things such as resort fees and other fees that more and more hotel operators add on to the bill. So the rate may be $199 a night, but then when you read the fine print, there's additional fees um, for various things. Um, and that's a trend that has both um, supporters and detractors. Obviously, uh, there is a, it is big business, and it does um, generate a lot of revenue. But in some cases, is it worthwhile upsetting guests by nickel and diming them, if you will, um, for these added fees. And so there's a, a lot of discussion around that. But another trend that you will um, need to be aware of is over time, our booking window has grown shorter and shorter. And what I mean by that is five, ten years ago, a group would be looking to stay at your hotel maybe five or six years into the future. Oftentimes now, we get a group who will come to us and say, yes, we're looking at staying at your hotel next April. So the shorting, the short term um, booking has become more of a trend. The other thing is that that also is true with guests, um, individual travelers, I should say, transient guests, not groups. Um, so as an example, five, 10 years ago or more, you would have planned a, a stay at a hotel weeks and weeks in advance and you would have called the reservations hotline and you would have made your reservations. Nowadays there are websites that allow you to make same day bookings so we have guests who will literally um, arrive in Seattle without a hotel reservation, they'll go onto these websites, they'll make their reservation in the day for the day. Um, on average we have five to ten uh, of those type of reservations a day at our hotel. Um, and so it's just changed the way that people operate in hotels. Self-booking. Um, again, 20 years ago, most reservations or a lot of reservations went through booking uh, travel agencies and booking companies. Uh, now we do it on apps. So it's just changed the way we operate, and it's a trend that will continue. Social experiences and cause-based traveling. Uh, one of the articles that I have assigned is... Uh, volunteer programs for lesbian, gay, uh, bisexual, and transgender travelers. And that is 
uh, talking about the different um, one example of this social uh, cause based travel. So people um, and this is just one example. There's many people will travel to a location to to volunteer uh, to to participate in volunteer programs. Uh, many times we have groups that will come and stay with us, and part of their activities over the course of their conference will be to go out and help in the local community. And so more and more, these um, social community service activities are becoming a trend. Um, another trend which we're going to go into more here is the sharing economy. And this is, as I started this lecture, a huge change in the last few years. Um, Airbnb, Link, Uber, there are many that allow you to share uh, your own car or your own house, as an example, um, to, uh, to generate some money. So just diving right in here with this is Airbnb and uh, the sharing economy in this case is if I have a spare bedroom and I can go on to Airbnb and register and rent it out. And now the uh, impact on the lodging industry, of course, is that that takes away from potentially from my uh, revenues. If I have a hotel in a city and there are a large number of private residents that, that rent out their bedrooms to, to guests, um, it's going to impact my business. Now, the, the, uh, not every hotel company is against the Airbnb. Don't get me wrong. Many of, the, um, many of these hotel operators understand that this is a benefit to the entire industry uh, because of the fact that it does encourage travel and, and uh, vacations in locations where, um, where guests may not have gone otherwise. The, the important thing for us as hotel operators in this case to, to consider is what does this have to do or how does this impact our own expansion plans and what opportunities can we as hotel operators um, find in this type of sharing economy trend. We also have, um, as I mentioned, we have the other uh, transportation, trends in transportation, which is Uber. Um, this is uh, the same thing as Airbnb, but for your car. So you can go on to Uber or Lyft, and it allows you to, um, to become a cab company for yourself. Um, and so th these obviously have uh, been all over the news lately. There are a lot of cities and counties that have taken steps to... Um, to stop Uber and Lyft. Um, they require people to register or to take driving tests. Uh, certainly drug and alcohol screening is important. Um, Illinois recently, the governor um, was involved in uh, vetoing legislation regarding these restrictions. Uh, Germany recently outlawed uh, Uber, um, but they continue to be used there. Um, and so there's just a lot of conversation going on about these uh, about these sharing trends or these trends in transportation the sharing economy here um, you know who is liable in the event of an accident in a in a cab company with with a a large amount of insurance um, you know they they take liability very seriously of course but if you're driving your car and you have someone in your car who you're ride sharing with who's liable there for in an accident if it occurs. Lyft is just another example, same thing as Uber. Um, but one of the things that I thought was interesting in an article that I read was about how Uber and Lyft um, have become obviously so competitive against one another that there is there was accusations um, that one of the two companies was actually um, trying to recruit drivers from the other company and by that what they were doing was Lyft was as an example was calling Uber drivers or was booking with Uber drivers to get them to come and pick up this person who was actually a recruiter for the other company 
Um, and so if I wanted to recruit you to Lyft, as an example, I would call the, you the Uber driver, you'd come pick me up, I'd get in your car, and I would try to recruit you to Lyft instead of Uber. Um, this was, um, is hurting the income of some of those drivers in this example, because if they pick up the recruiter and they say, no, I'm not interested, they let them out and they have not made much of a fare. Um, and then there's also a lot of cancellations that occur. Um, and so it's just an interesting facet to, the, uh, to this new um, trend, which is, um, you know, that, that there's a lot of competition and there's a lot of companies out there um, that are, you know, certainly uh, focused on, um, on driving their competition, uh, you know, Im impacting their competition in negative ways. So I'm going to just conclude the conversation here by saying that in this age of great change, um, with these startups and these apps that are developed uh, that challenge existing business models, the travel industry, tra travel and tourism industry in as a whole, will need to continue to change to meet the needs of the traveling public. Um, so there on the screen are some of the sources. Uh, you have copies of this uh, lecture on Moodle. And I also want to say, as I uh, mentioned at the beginning, I'm going to send out, um, it's Sunday, I'm going to send out a little bit later today an email with the assignments for all of you for week three. So please let me know if you have any questions. Thank you all so much. Have a great day. Goodbye.